guys' slideshow says uh, there is information um, for information under contractors um, out on our DCA website. We can kind of go there at the end if anybody isn't familiar with our website and information for contractors. Um, before I get started today, has anybody had experience with provisional billing rates on a public voucher? Have you submitted rates or have you submitted rates? Okay, well, I mean, I used to work for CACI, so okay, I didn't actually do it, but we do it every, you know, they did it every year. Okay, so I just like to get a feel for if there's been some experience, um, and then I'm going to go through what the provisional billing rates, um, the purpose of them are, the procedures for establishing them, you know, when you submit it, should submit, it, submit them, what information um, should you provide. What does DCA do, DCA do when we review them? What are your requirements for monitoring them? Um, some common deficiencies that we've found when we have reviewed the rates, and then um, some frequently asked questions that we've gotten from contractors over the years. So when you get a cost site contract, you bill internally, which Robin will talk about um, voucher processing here shortly. Um, but as part of those billings, you have to bill somehow bill your indirect costs. So that's where provisional billing rates come in. Is you um, establish provisional billing rates to bill internally with your direct costs. This is how you recover your indirect costs. Uh, it ties into the DFARS, uh, the criteria for an adequate accounting system that can be reconciled to the cost accounts for those current cumulative amounts claimed and complied with contract terms. So you need to keep track of all costs associated with your contracts, both direct and indirect. And interim payments on cost type contracts are allowed as specified in the contract provisions. So normally the contract provisions will establish that you can bill once a month, twice a month. It's no more than twice a month. Um, it generally, it, people bill twice a month. Some people bill less infrequently. You know, some people bill every three, four months. Um, some people bill once a month. You know, it just kind of depends on what you negotiate with or what you talk with, with the uh, procurement contracting officer with the ACO and kind of what is decided. Um, provisional billing rates are established to approximate um, what you believe that your rates will be at the end of the year. And it, obviously, it's also by any unallowable cost. So, at the end of the year, what do you think your indirect costs will be? So that way you can bill those internally through the year. So provisional billing rates are used for interim purposes until those final uh, rates are agreed to uh, through the incurred cost process. Um, billing rates, um, FAR 52-704 provides procedures and guidance for establishing billing rates that we're going to go over some of that right now. So the responsibility for establishing the provisional billing rates um, rests with either the contracting officer or the uh, cognizant auditor. So it it's based upon who determines your final indirect rate. So if you have contractor or contracting officer determine final rates, they set the rates. If it's, if it's auditor determined rates, then DCA will set the rates or the cognizant auditor. Um, when the contracting officer, uh, you're actually not required to submit a submission, but it always is the preferred way. Um, how we will establish it if we don't get a submission from you guys showing us what your, uh, you know, what you project your indirect costs to be and your indirect rates to be, we'll do a basic on things like history or facts that we know um, and prior year experiences. So, and it's important to know that sometimes the contracting officer may request DCA's help, even though they're, they're the ones responsible for uh, uh, establishing those rates, they may request our assistance. So, um, the procedures for the submission. So if you do submit a rate, like I said, we can 
establish rates from information that we have in our file, and we have done that, but most contractors will normally submit something, su submit a rate package. Um, you will submit them to the office, to the DCA office, or the administrative contracting officer. You can find your cognizant DCA office by going to the FAO, FAO, FAO locator on the DCA website. Um, it's always nice to get electronic submissions because then we can do the math check, especially if you have multiple spreadsheets or allocations to see where those numbers are coming from and balance. And then in Excel format or on a disk or CD or through email would um, be the preferred way. Um, when you do email, I strongly encourage you to email. We have what's called the DCAA FAO mailboxes. So that goes to a, a email mailbox in the office as opposed to, say for instance, myself, because like if I'm out on extended leave or I missed the email or it's not my, it may not be my contractor, so it may not flag my attention, that goes and is checked a couple times a day. So, and then the admin will get it. Now, a lot of what a lot of people will do is send it to the FAO mailbox and then they may copy who they know their cognizant, you know, supervisory auditor or auditor is, because a lot of times people want to feel that they have that connection with a person that's just not going to outer space. But I know we've had some occasions where they've sent it to people that have, you know, left DCAA, have retired, or have moved on to different positions, and they've just kind of been lost in outer space, and it's three or four months later, we're like, did you guys get that? And we're like, no, and then when they forward the email, you know, we, we uh, figure out as to why. So I always encourage people, any correspondence, you know, when you're submitting something is to go to the DCA mailbox. So, when you submit, should, when should um, you should submit? So, it's always important to try and submit these prior to the beginning of the fiscal year. You know, once you've established your budget or where, where, where you think your costs are going to go um, or be at during the year. So that way these rates can be established and set, established and the rate letter can be issued when you begin to bill those costs during the fiscal year. So uh, they should rep represent, you know, uh, the 12 month period, the fiscal year. So depending on when the fiscal year ends, obviously would depend on what, what when in the calendar year you submit your rates. Um, they should be submitted uh, at least annually. Um, and vouchers and progress payments can be returned if submitted without proper establishing billing rates. So if you submit a public voucher and we don't have properly established billing rates, say we don't have information from you that we've requested to establish these billing rates, um, that we may reject the voucher for payment. So, it, and we may, like if we're, if we're responsible for, request, for establishing them and we don't get a submission, we may ask for information. So, and if, if you know, you're non-responsive then and you have rates, um, if you have rates in your uh, voucher as you should, then we don't know what's right, wrong, and different. We don't have anything to support it. We don't know where it's coming from. So we would usually reject that voucher. So again, it's, it's important to um, submit them early and prior to the beginning of the fiscal year if possible. Um, so that way we have time to review them. So what should be provided? Um, obviously the calculations with a brief rationale to say, you know, what makes up the full cost and what makes up the base. Like how did you arrive at your rate? You know, how did you estimate your cost? Um, and then also the prior year pool and base, it's good because we do comparative analysis. So if that's included, if it's not included, we'll request it if we don't have it in our file. Um, for contractors who, you know, have contracts who we, we uh, audit on a year-to-year -year basis, we have a database established where we retain this information. Um, current year budgets and base, you know, if available, and if you've done any comparative analysis with explanations of significant differences, and 
you know, it's always good, especially if you if your if your budget year is significantly different from history to explain, you know, why those variances occurred. You know, um, was there a contract award that significantly increased your base, or um, why did those pool costs go up a significant increase in health care costs? Um, those are things that we can consider and. You know, that way we have the explanation of those outliers when we do that comparative analysis. So when we um, conduct a review, um, some of the, the procedures that we perform are, like I said before, we compare prior years and year to date pool and base. So like if we don't get to actually audit the, or I shouldn't say audit, perform a review of the provisional billing rates um, prior to the beginning of the, of the year, uh, we may ask you for your year to date actuals and compare your year to date actuals. So, because sometimes, you know, while we, uh, you know, our goal is to get them established you know, in a timely manner. We don't always, other work sometimes takes priority, you know, but, and then we just, that doesn't stop us from processing your vouchers or anything like that. So we, when we process the vouchers, we'll go look at the submission and, you know, see if we have um, any concerns. <clears throat> but, you know, sometimes we, we don't get to them, you know, as we would like to. But that's why we, to when we talk about the year-to-date costs, we may ask for them. Um, and we will review any trend of question costs. Like if we had question costs uh, re, uh, in previous years, we may look to say, to see how those are reflected in the current rates. You know, do we anticipate that we question those costs? Was there unallowables? Do we need to decrement the rate? So we may do those, uh, some of those procedures in calculating the provisional billing rates. And you know, it's important to remember that we're not, we're going to communicate this with you. You know, we're not just gonna get your submission and set your rates differently. We're gonna communicate back and forth. So I know we've had several instances where, you know, we may have been aware of some information that when we looked at the contractor's uh, provisional billing rates proposed, we said, did you guys consider this? You know, and, and they, the contractor has ultimately like re, resubmitted um, the rate. So we kind of take what we know too, because we're doing some other audits or out there, uh, or we, we are looking at the incurred costs routinely. So we have some information where we may, you know, again, know some, uh, know some areas where there could be adjustments. So. Again, we're not just going to adjust the rates without, you know, it's, you're going to know if we're going to adjust it different from what you uh, submitted it as. Any questions so far? Feel free to raise your hand at any time. So, as we all know, things change. So, uh, it is the responsibility that you monitor your rates throughout the year. And immediately after the end of the end of the year, and submit the incur cost submission within six months. And provisional billing rates can be adjusted by either party at any time um, to prevent overpayment or underpayment. So if you, in the middle of the year, you become aware of something that's significantly going to change your indirect rates, you, you are required to let us know. Hey, this event happened. My indirect rates are going to significantly go up. They're going to significantly decrease um, again that can be by either party so like if we become aware of something we'll contact you um, and it is routine that we do get resubmissions of provisional billing rates um, so again you know the goal is to make sure that the, there, there isn't a substantial amount of over or under payment and then if the provisional billing rates are adjusted you should submit uh, adjustment vouchers accordingly. So again, you know, once those rates are established, you the costs that you build already during the year, you want to go back and 
adjust those to either upward or downward to reflect the new curve rates. So some of the common deficiencies that we've seen when we review these provisional billing rates are fair, failure to remove unallowable cost from the billing uh, rate projections. So somebody may you know, gather information from their accounting system and not and not uh, adjust those for costs that are not considered allowable for FAR 31205. Um, failure to adjust provisional billing rates based on actual experience. So before the end of the year, if there are known reasonable and, um, and significant anticipated variances, so like the increase or decrease of insurance or maybe the increase or decrease of um, an allocation base in the future. And then after the year end, once the actual rates, um, the net of unallowable expenses are calculated. So again, so a lot of those are related to, you know, you don't, not adjusting for known uh, changes or variances and not adjusting for those unallowable frequently asked questions is, uh, do I submit the provisional billing rate proposal to the ACO or the DCAA office? Again, FAR 42704 indicates the office responsible for the final indirect cost rates also establishes the provisional billing rates. Um, for most of the small contractors in this area, they are established by DCAA. Um, so again, you can ask your ACO or your DCA office, you know, who is who is responsible for establishing them. Um, if the final, if their ACO determines, submit to the ACO, and if their audit determines, submit to the DCA office. I know a lot of times when they're submitted, people will copy the ACO on them anyway, so that way they're, you know, where they were submitted. And, you know, we communicate, you know, with the ACOs uh, on a regular basis. So can I just use the most recent year-end rates for my provisional billing rates? The answer is no. Um, the responsible official may establish the billing rates based on prior history, less unallowables. But you should look at those prior years and say, is that a true you know, indication of my future? So you just, you have to look to say, if, if it is, then maybe your historical rates are the best thing for you to submit. But you know, without looking at it, looking at the information, looking at the data, and looking to say, do I have any anticipated changes? You know, do I expect my cost to increase? Do I expect my cost to decrease? Do I expect my base to increase or decrease? You know, depending on the workload. Um, and then if budgeted data is available, your proposed provisional billing rates may be based on the budgeted. Again, make sure that you account for those unallowable costs. Um, as prescribed in FAR 31205. So the next question is, once they're established, do I need to submit a proposal to change based on new information? As I talked about, yes. You know, if you know something that has happened within your business or you gotta get a new contract that significantly increases your base or lose a contract that significantly decreases the base, then um, when it's known and if there's significant changes and variances can occur, then it, you do have an obligation to um, let the ECA and let the ACO know of those changes. And so we can change the billing rates as necessary. Kind of a non secretary. If you're a, a young a small <coughs> business and if you want to go after I think, um, straight to SBIR2, you have to have, they say you have to have a um, certified accounting system. Mm -hmm. But when I call to try to get a review of my accounting system, 
since I don't have a contract, they're like, we can't help you. So I, I don't, how do I move forward? It has to come through, the, the PCO can, like if you're working with a contracting officer, the PCO can request us to do a free work comment system before award. Because I went, cause the, I went to a, like, um, earlier this year, like, direct phase two discussions, and they said before you, you even submit, so you don't have a PCO, you have to have a certified kind of system. Do you know anything? Did you, did you, are you not trying, did you submit for phase one? There is no phase one. It goes, it just starts phase yeah, two? It starts phase two. Direct yeah. phase two. And then, so I went to a collider here, and they said you have to have a certified accounting system in place before submitting. So I don't have, so I don't have any, so I don't meet the minimum requirement to submit to get a. I would just, did they list like a, did they list a contracting officer on there? Yeah, so I, I just call I them. Then, I, would call I would call them and tell them that you are a small business and you have yet to have a DCA approved accounting system, but, you, but you're very interested okay. in applying, you know, and, they should be able to let you do it and then review it, Correct. but it's, I would okay. at least let them know. I mean, they well, should be able to allow you to apply for it. Yeah. As long as you put a note in there that you are requested through the PCO and put the name of the PCO to have that review. So if we, you do qualify for that, you know, they'll right. take it, they see your proposal and you do qualify, they're interested, they will request us to do it. I was going to say, we do actually a lot of pre-award accounting systems in that manner. Mm -hmm. So where they don't yet have a contract, but through the PCO, the contracting officer, the, okay. they, they'll request. So hopefully yeah, well, our company's in the same boat and we're just waiting. Like we're working now with an outside accounting firm to get compliant so that we're ahead of the game. So that when something comes up, we're gonna go to the PCO or whomever and say, hey, you know, we've been working towards this. Can we propose, you know, how, how can we do this? Because I mean, otherwise you're stuck. You gotta do something. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. you gotta get your foot in the door somehow. So well, maybe that's something we can take back to share with you to, to the chiefs. Make sure yeah. the chiefs are aware. Yeah, because I was scared. Because I was like, well, I just want like initial reviews, so like correct anything before yeah. you know, yeah. like the proposal. But they, they do have outside. So, um, we can't advise of any, but they, they are outside um, consultants who are familiar with what is requirements. Um, do you know of the standard form 1408? Yeah, and, I, and I, I went through that and to make sure that everything checked off. That you checked, checked off. Okay. Yes, and so yeah, so everything checks appears to check off. But do you ever have you ever worked like with ACO like on DCMA at all on other contracts? No, I'm a I'm a sub uh, time and material contract okay. right now, and so I've submitted my rates and I submitted all my how these rates were derived. And, they, and that was approved. Okay. And then I have, like, I got, I'm using, but I've designed my system myself, so that's why I'm a little scared. So it's a double entry accounting system. I do my, you know, I have all my charge codes broken down by task order and line item, and I keep track of like travel and direct and everything. But again, I designed it myself, and so I was just, that's what makes me a little like, I'm scared. Well, and if you're a subcontractor too, you may be able to work through the prime Fun. and the prime contracting officer to get a review of the accounting system. I'm scared to do that because like it's working right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, but that's another avenue okay, to um, have that sub is to work through the, to the prime, the prime and the and prime, prime contracting, contracting officer. Yeah. The prime contracting officer can request it. Okay. So. And the prime contractor. The prime contractor yes. can request it to, yeah. to their PCO. Yeah, they can request it to their PCO or said they request to the our DCMA office, I think is how they'll do it, and then they'll send the request to us. Okay. So, but, so that that's another avenue since you do have a subcontract. Okay. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering, what is the average overhead rate for a DOD contract? It depends. I, I, you, there is no, there is no, it depends on how you structure your business and how, you know, what your overhead costs are. No two contractors are the same. Yeah, I know. I mean, that, that. I've seen very, I mean, I've seen 
ten percent to two hundred percent. It mean, depends on your business. Like some it people depends. work out their house, so they don't yeah. have the so the rent. Or you, some people have four, five, six, seven overhead rates. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, can you tell us a little more about how you are justified to over one hundred percent? Or I I used to work at university where I only had forty or fifty percent. But uh, I know I heard that the company always submit higher, much higher. Than the Overhead. Again, it just depends on what your overhead costs are and how you're, what you're allocating them over. So, I mean, there is, I mean, your cost, your direct cost and your indirect cost should justify the rate itself. So, you could, so I should do more, it's very detailed and have a list mm -hmm. of how that indirect cost was. Mm -hmm. You need a chart of accounts. You need to like have a chart of accounts to say, I paid out all these indirect expenses and then you know, and you'll list them by category, and then those will add up, and that'll be your pool, and then your base will be what, however you decided, you know, most equitable to allocate them over. Is so it? is that uh, any kind of a document have a list of what, um, what type of cost it is allowed, which is what type? Um, FAR 31, to, FAR 31, 205 talks about it, but there's information for contractors which is a DCAA pamphlet, which talks a lot in detail about the incur cost submission, um, and then it'll walk you through the FAR, but like allowable and unallowable expenses is really, you know, FAR 31, 205, but also FAR 31 in general talks about, you know, the allowability of costs and allocability of costs. Online. I think I, so, yeah. <laughs> FAR site is but, usually... What, what I use, uh, Hill Air Force Base has a pretty good uh, site for the FAR, I think. If you're looking for how the rates are allocated, you can do the, um, there's an example of the incur cost submission that you submit in the air. They do have examples of yeah. pools okay. and bases and how they, and how it computes the actual indirect rate for overhead and GNA. Okay. Yeah, so at least it'll give you an idea on how the rates are calculated and what's comprised of those rates. And our website is dcaa.mil. Okay. And there's a drop down box that's. Actually, we can, actually, we do, yeah. at the end of the presentation, we can. It's in the small show. contractor section. Yeah. yeah. We can show you how to get there um, right. at the end of the presentation. So. And the NIH had a Google, NIH had an Excel spreadsheet that you can, um, so just if you just get an idea of what, fix it down for like, you know, janitor. Rent. And so you can see what types of expenses can go into the There's a ton of variables in that you determine, you know, if you're just a small business with a few people, it's pretty easy to calculate, but if you got a couple hundred people working for you, man, it's, it's pretty complicated. There are multiple locations yeah. and multiple functions. And, you, you know, some your, companies have manufacturing and engineering. Yeah. So. Different rates, for, definitely different rates for that. Yeah. So, the short answer is it depends. <laughs> so, are you just by yourself or? Yeah, by yourself. One and a half. One and a half, yeah. Yeah, we showed you it can be pretty easy to calculate. Yeah, I think that incur cost submission, like the example, will really help kind of walk you through an example of how somebody does it. And then, like I said, the information for contractors does kind of go into detail about what's an indirect cost, what's a direct cost, and I think and it talks about allocation basis. So that should be some help. So you know, as Robin said, there's a lot of help out there. You know, we can't say you know where to go or who to go to, but we know that there is a lot of help out there um, in the private sector. And some of them are ex DCA retired. Yeah. So. <laughs> And, and it never hurts to ask people like in here, you know, I'm networking and you get lots of help because um, other people have been through it too, you know, the learning process of starting your own business, you know, it's, there's a lot of things you got to learn, especially if you're a former government employee or your university employee and stuff, just going out and starting your own business, it's not easy, there's a lot of things you got to learn, that's why we have these clubs. <laughs> Some things we can be more helpful with, and other yeah. things we, you know, have rules and regulations that we have to yeah, follow. Exactly. We have yeah. independence that we have to follow.
All right, I think, Mr. Robin is up. Robin's you guys up. want a break or anything? Or anything?